In the previous lecture, we looked at the diffraction patterns of some two-dimensional crystals, and we also learned about the equations, Laue's equations, which govern the angles which give constructive interference in a three-dimensional crystals. Remember that when we had here a two-dimensional rectangular lattice, we saw a diffraction pattern that was also rectangular, but there was an inverse relationship between the spacing of the peaks in our diffraction pattern and the spacing of the atoms in our real space crystal. As it turns out, the relationship between these two is something called the reciprocal lattice. So in this lecture, we're going to see how we can generate a reciprocal lattice given any real space lattice, and then we'll finish by seeing how that is mathematically related to the conditions that are specified by Laue's equations. Before we jump into this, it would be helpful to review a little bit of vector math. We're going to need to use two different uh, vector manipulations in the derivations we do during this lecture. The dot product, sometimes called the scalar product, and the cross product, which is sometimes called the vector product. So the dot product is, as the name would suggest, a scalar, and its value is equal to the product of vector A times the projection of vector B onto vector A. We could express that with this equation. The dot product of vectors A and B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times cosine of the angle between them. So if the two vectors would be parallel, the dot product would just be their magnitudes times each other. And if the two vectors are perpendicular, the dot product would be zero. The cross product is a vector, and that vector must be perpendicular to both A and B. And the length or magnitude of the vector is equal to the area of the parallelogram that's defined by vectors A and B. So the formula that would give the magnitude of A cross B is going to be the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times sine of the angle between them. And in almost the opposite case of the dot product, here the magnitude will be a maximum when the two vectors are perpendicular to one another. In that case, the magnitude will be a times b. And it will go to zero when the two vectors are parallel to one another. OK, let's review the idea of a three-dimensional lattice which, as we learned in earlier lectures, is really the defining characteristic of a crystal. In any three-dimensional lattice, we have an infinite array of lattice points. And all of those lattice points are generated by linearly combining three lattice vectors, A, B, and C, which are marked here with red arrows. So if we were to pick a point like this one, you know, we can get to this point from the origin by taking 1 times a vector A, plus 2 times lattice vector B, plus 2 times lattice vector C. Now, if we were to zoom in on a single unit cell, right? the unit cell in a three-dimensional lattice is a parallelopiped defined by these three lattice vectors. Now we're going to define three different vectors, which are going to be the vectors that generate what we'll call the reciprocal space lattice. The reciprocal lattice vectors are defined in terms of the real space lattice vectors with the following equations. The reciprocal space lattice vector A star is going to be defined as the cross product of the real space vectors B and C divided by the volume of the real space unit cell. OK, so this vector must be perpendicular both to B and C, and its length is defined by this formula. Uh, the other reciprocal space lattice vectors, B star and C star, are defined in an analogous manner. If we look at, for example, B star, just by the way we define it, remember that B star must be perpendicular to lattice vector A, and it must be perpendicular to lattice vector C. 
But another important thing falls out of this relationship is vectors A and C define a plane. If you have two vectors, those two vectors are sufficient to define a plane. That plane happens to be the AC face of our unit cell. Well, the reciprocal space last vector B star must be perpendicular to that plane by definition. And in fact, that's a, a simpler way to define the orientation of that plane. If we have the vector that is normal to the plane, that one vector is enough to define the entire plane. So we see that the reciprocal space lattice vectors are perpendicular to the various faces of the unit cell. And therefore, we'll call them face normal vectors. So the B star reciprocal space vector is perpendicular to the AC face of the real space unit cell. A star is perpendicular to the BC face of the unit cell. And then the C star lattice vector is perpendicular to the AB face of the real space unit cell. Now, in this particular unit cell that I've drawn here, I've made C perpendicular to A and B. This is a non-conventional setting of a monoclinic lattice. And so that means that C star is going to be parallel to C. Both of them are going to be perpendicular to A and B. But that's not true of the A star and the B star lattice vectors. Those are not necessarily parallel to any of the real space lattice vectors. So let's take a little closer look at the AB plane. Right, so if we were to look down to the C axis of our real space crystal lattice, we would have a picture that looks something like this. I've arbitrarily put some links in for the different lattice vectors, and we're going to make A six angstroms and B seven angstroms. So B is a little bit longer, and the angle between them here is 105 degrees. Well, here's what the reciprocal space lattice would look like in the A star B star plane. A star has to be perpendicular to both B and C of the real space unit cell. And you can see that a, a vertical vector here would be perpendicular to B, which is drawn horizontal on the left-hand side here. And then the vector B star is going to be perpendicular to A. And because C is perpendicular to the plane of this projection, they're both going to be perpendicular also to C. The angle gamma, which was 105 in the real space lattice, becomes 75 degrees in the reciprocal space lattice. Notice also that B was longer than A in the real space lattice, so we get the opposite relationship in our reciprocal space lattice. A star is longer than B star. To give you just a little bit more familiarity, let's look at a couple of examples of real space lattices. I'm going to choose ones where we have at least one lattice vector perpendicular to the other two because then we can look at a projection in the screen here. If we were to start with a cubic lattice where A, B, and C were all four angstroms and of course mutually perpendicular, the reciprocal space lattice would also be cubic. And the length of the reciprocal space lattice vector would just be 1 over the length of the real space lattice vector. The units here are angstroms, and the units here are 1 over angstrom. What would happen if I were to, let's say, change the size of my unit cell? Let's say I doubled the cubic lattice constant. So now the lattice points are 8 angstroms apart. The lattice points in the reciprocal space lattice would now be halved. Instead of being 0.25 apart, they would be 0.125. So we see that when we make the real space lattice larger, the reciprocal space lattice gets smaller. And that's due to the inverse relationship between the two. If we were to look at an orthorhombic lattice where A, B, and C are all different lengths, but still perpendicular, and here I've chosen some arbitrary values for the lengths of the lattice vectors. My reciprocal space lattice would look like this. As long as we have orthogonal crystal systems, cubic, tetragonal, orthorhombic, the 
A and the A star are going to be parallel. The B and the B star will be parallel to one another. And the C and the C star, both coming out at us, will be parallel to one another. So the only thing that's changing is the lengths. Um, here, A of the real space lattice is smaller than B. So we see yeah, that's inverted in the reciprocal space lattice. If we were to now look at a hexagonal lattice, now the vectors A and B are not orthogonal. Right? There's an angle of 120 degrees between the two lattice vectors. So the reciprocal space lattice vectors, we can basically generate this graphically. We know that B star has to be down or vertical because B is horizontal, the way I've drawn it in this picture. And then we know that A star has to be perpendicular to A. Of course, both A star and B star are perpendicular to C because C is normal to the plane of this projection. And the angle between A and B, which is 120 degrees in the real space lattice, becomes 60 degrees in the reciprocal space lattice. Now I want to link that reciprocal space lattice to the diffraction patterns we saw in the last lecture. But before we do that, it will be helpful to review some of the mathematical relationships between the real and reciprocal space lattice vectors. By the way it was defined, when we take a reciprocal space lattice vector like A star, it has to be perpendicular to both B and C, and that means the dot product of A star and B or A star and C, will be zero. The same thing holds for the B star and C star lattice vectors. So anytime we take the dot product of a real space lattice vector and a reciprocal space lattice vector, if the two are different, then that dot product is going to be zero. What happens if we take the dot product of the A and the A star lattice vectors? Well, A star lattice vector was defined as follows. It's the cross product of B times C divided by the volume. But we could rewrite the volume of a parallelopiped as the cross product of two vectors. And that resulting vector, we take the dot product of it with the third lattice vector. And so that's our volume. But now we can take this term out in front and just move it up into the numerator. So we see that the dot product of A and A star is equal to 1. And that's also true for the dot products of B times B star or C times C star. So we see that whenever we take the dot product of a real space lattice vector and a reciprocal space lattice vector, the outcome is either 1 or 0, depending on the identities of the vectors. All right, what's the relevance of that to diffraction? Let's go back to Lowy's equations. This is where we finished the previous lecture, right? And we said that the dot product of lattice vector A times this quantity, S minus S naught, has to be equal an integer number of wavelengths. S is a unit vector that describes the direction of the scattered or diffracted beam. And S0 is a unit vector that describes the direction of the incoming beam. And in order to get constructive interference, we need to satisfy all three of Lowy's equations simultaneously. If we were to define the direction of the diffracted beam, I'm going to say that that's going to be equal to the direction of the incoming beam plus any reciprocal space lattice vector times the wavelength. And here, h, k, and l are integers. And the vectors a star, b star, and c star are the vectors that define the reciprocal space lattice. Let's take this expression and use it as the vector that defines the direction of the scattered beam and plug it back into uh, one of these Lowy equations. So we'll take the top one. We have the dot product of a and you know, this vector S minus S naught. But the S naught at the beginning and then subtract the S naught at the end, those cancel out. So we're left with the dot product of the real space vector A 
times this quantity in parentheses, which is the vector from the origin of the reciprocal space lattice to any point in the reciprocal space lattice. That's multiplied by the wavelength. Because dot product is a scalar quantity, we can uh, write this expression as shown here. The dot product of A and A star is equal to 1, while the dot product of A with either B star or C star must be 0. So we're left with h lambda equals h lambda. So as long as h, k, and l are integers, any vector s that's defined as follows will satisfy all three Laue equations. And what that means is that the positions of the diffraction peaks map onto the points that are defined by the reciprocal lattice. Knowing what the reciprocal lattice is tells us what kind of diffraction pattern to expect. And we'll come back to the slide that we showed at the beginning. If this is our real space lattice, I can define reciprocal space lattice vectors, and then I can generate my reciprocal space lattice. If my instant beam is coming in normal to this plane, I will get constructive interference and diffraction peaks at points that are exactly on our reciprocal space lattice. And we can even go a little bit further and look at any given point. Like, let's look at this point. Right? If this would be the origin, right? this would be all of the angles zero. This is the direct beam. Uh, then if I look at the constructive interference that's happening up here, it's going to be given by minus 2 times the A star direction and 1 times the B star direction. Minus 2, 1, 0, or... 2 bar 1, 0 is the index of this particular diffraction peak. Here's another one. This would be twice times the A star vector plus 3 times the B star vector. That would be the index of this particular diffraction peak. And as we move farther and farther from the origin, we see that the diffracted beam has a longer and longer path length, but that path length is always such that it's an integer number of wavelengths.